Hello everyone, welcome to a games industry discussion with uh, Jason Schreier here, who was kind enough to join us. So first things first, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Hello, Yang. Thank you so much for having me on your channel. I appreciate it. Sure thing. Um, obviously, we haven't seen eye to eye on everything, but uh, I think that's no reason to come together and just talk, share our perspectives, uh, see what we can learn and uh, move forward, because I think ultimately that's more productive than you know, like just the back and forths that that are that happen spontaneously and sporadically. So um, I hope we can, uh, yeah, have something productive here to share with the audience. And uh, I'm really excited to hear your insight on some of the recent events. Yeah, I mean, I actually think that you and I agree on more things than mm -hmm. even we have talked about. Um, I just think I think we have a few key differences that I'm hoping to chat sure. about. But yeah, let's let's jump right yeah, in. Yeah, let's just jump right in. Um, obviously, the big topic right now: microtransactions and loot boxes. Uh, for me, it really became apparent uh, how prevalent this was all. Uh, this all was after Battlefront Two. I, mm -hmm. They were kind of there in the back of my mind, like Metal Gear Solid V had like a bit of microtransactions here and uh, like Assassin's Creed 3 back in the day. I remember like some people complained about the microtransactions there, but I think once uh, the Battlefront 2 debacle began, that's when it really started to pick up. And so I guess uh, something a lot of people are wondering is what is your stance? Where, where do you think one draws the line? Because there was that one moment when you talked about Assassin's Creed Odyssey and you expressed mm -hmm. adamantly that uh, this is, uh, in your perspective, blown out of proportion, that this is fine, that this is not intrusive uh, versus others who are saying this is kind of bullshit. So mm -hmm. where do you stand on that front? Yeah, so, okay, so I think microtransactions are a very complicated topic and mm -hmm. I, as, just as a personal interest, am much more uh, inclined to talk about how did we get here, mm -hmm. why are companies doing this, why are we at this point where it feels like every single game has to have all these add-ons on top of the already pricey $60 entry right. point. Right. Um, that's my. That's in general what I prefer to talk about than just getting mad about the latest controversy. Sure. Um, so Battlefront 2 is an interesting case that was at the end of a whole lot Lot of microtransaction controversies mm -hmm. last year, including uh, Shadow of War, and uh, I think there was some bad stuff with uh, one of the racing games, forgetting which one. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And then, and some of those were egregious. I mean, Battlefront Two was very clearly egregious. Yes. Um, jump to last month, Assassin's Creed Odyssey, and what you're pr probably referring to is a couple of tweets that I sent out where mm -hmm. I talked about how um, I personally did not notice or mind the microtransactions, yes. and I saw some articles and some YouTube videos about how Assassin's Creed Odyssey has this XP booster, mm -hmm. and that ruins the game. And I've done a lot of thinking and talking about like that XP booster and its existence. Have you played the game? Have you played yes, Assassin's I Creed have. Odyssey? I have. Have you finished it, or just played I've, some of it? I've not finished it, but I'm like... Uh... Uh, more than halfway through, but eventually. Just and have you noticed out. the XP booster at all? I I wish I would have the option to toggle it without it mm -hmm. being paywalled. I will say that I, I wish I could just, even if it's not, even if people are fine with uh, the non XP boosted version of the game, I do wish I had the option to enable that so I could maybe speed things along in certain sections of the game, mm -hmm. um, because. Uh, there, for example, I recently started playing Diablo 3 on Switch. What I love about that game is that uh, it has multiple difficulty modes, each with their own sort of XP rate. Um, so I started with the lowest difficulty, but the XP rate was slow and I found the game too easy. And then I could just say, OK, I don't want that to happen anymore. So I could just go back to the main menu, switch back to expert mode or master mode. And I got like 200 percent XP, but also the enemies were much harder. And so I, I love that. And uh, so in Odyssey, that was kind of stripped away, I felt. Uh, not killed mm -hmm. the game, but uh, I wish I had that option for sure. The actual, I think, player choice, you know? Yeah, so you so you felt like the level balance was off for you and you wish you could have sped it up? You felt like you were running into difficulty, difficulty spikes? Yeah, especially towards uh, sort of the latter half of the game. Um, mm -hmm. there, some might argue, unless, I think if you've been doing a lot of side quests, like you've just been clearing everything as you go along, you're mm -hmm. probably not going to notice it. But there are people who kind of maybe want to clear the story first and then maybe do some side quests and play mm -hmm. at their own pace. There are some people out there, some crowds that I think will certainly have felt that. 
So here's the yeah. problem. I mean, the problem with the XP booster is that the fact that it exists just creates that seed of doubt in our minds and mm -hmm. makes us wonder, oh my god, was this difficulty scaling built so they could sell us this $10 package? Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is a bigger, it's a more insidious problem than the fact that the game has microtransactions. The fact that it plants a seed of doubt in your mind and the fact that it's 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 such a different form of commodity than just exchanging money for something it's mm -hmm. not quite the same as buying an outfit um mm -hmm. which also i mean not enough people are talking about how egregious it is that you have to spend like 750 for a unicorn skin that's a whole nother thing but uh is that but, earnable uh, in game uh do you know I don't know. I don't think so. But the the fact that you you can pay for this thing that just affects the game mm -hmm. in this intangible way, I think that is what really bothers people. Mm -hmm. And I get that. But I think it's also really important to know and to be honest about your perspective on things. And when I played the game, I felt like, oh my god, like this feels sure. like one of those controversies that is just being turned into headlines because it is there. Mm -hmm. And that I think is interesting. And part of me felt like at the time, I mean, first of all, a lot of this, uh, one of the problems here is that people just take tweets and assume that this is like, like they, they look at my Twitter feed and mm -hmm. look at one of my tweets and say, oh my God, this is like, this guy's chiseling his opinion in stone, as mm -hmm. opposed to me just like, like writing a stray thought and mm -hmm. putting it out there. Um, and we'll get to that in a little bit, because sure. we're going to talk a little bit more about that in relation to Diablo Immortal. Sure. But with this, um, I, it felt to me like it was something that this massive, incredible game that I was playing, my thought was, oh my god, like I don't even notice this XP booster. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I can totally understand why people feel like it's, it's, its very presence is irritating them. And I think we're at this point where video game publishers are trying to find more and more ways to get that extra oh, yeah. revenue stream out of their games. And I think that going down that route is always going to be room for problems. It's always going to be, it's always going to raise questions questions about like the way that the mm -hmm. game was designed but that to me doesn't seem nearly as egregious as some of the, as some of the other things we've seen battlefront 2 is a perfect example and right. i think one of the problems with the way that we have these discussions is that it puts everything on the same level it's almost like like it's uh, there's no level of prioritization there's no level of like oh my god this is really egregious versus this is okay whatever it's not that big a deal and i think that that we as a quote unquote video game community for lack of a better term need to like it, it, when we get this angry about everything, I think it creates this poisonous world where uh, we are hurting a lot of people. And I think that gamer rage is a real problem. And I think a lot of that is caused as a result of not being able to prioritize and not being able to see the difference between something like Assassin's Creed Odyssey, where it's like, okay, this XP booster plants this idea in my mind. It's kind of annoying. I hate that it even exists, which I totally agree with that, versus... Uh, Battlefront 2, where you have to pay more if you want to get good at the multiplayer, at least before they removed all the microtransactions. Point being, um, I think that it's really important to see the levels in this and to not just treat everybody, everything, as if it is, quote-unquote, cancerous, as if it is exploitative. And that's the, the things that I was saying mm -hmm. on Twitter are that I think when you are screaming, when people are screaming, not necessarily, I'm, I'm not going to name names here, but I think when there's this world when we're just shrieking constantly about everything, I think it just creates this poisonous discourse. It leads to um, just lots of toxicity. It leads to uh, game developers burning out. It leads to hardcore game players just not wanting to be involved anymore. It leads to less people taking it less seriously when there are real problems. It just causes a lot of problems. Um, well, I and, yeah, go ahead. The notion that it's the thing is, uh, people understand that Battlefront Two is far worse than Assassin's Creed Odyssey. It's just mm -hmm. that I don't think that necessarily excuses what Assassin's Creed Odyssey is doing with the XP boosters. And I guess part of it is that different people have different criteria for what they deem acceptable. Um, like I, for example, I think if something is cosmetics, no random chance that you can just purchase directly. If it's reasonably priced and reasonably allowed to obtain via gameplay, um, and uh, it, it also helps if it's free to play versus single player, but mainly those that that first three criteria, uh, I, I think then people kind of overlook it. Like Fortnite, not a lot of people are talking about how egregious Fortnite is. There's some segments who say I think 
some of the skins are overpriced. Uh, but, but there is this system where you get the, va- the battle pass. You can, um, sort of, if you play a lot of the game, you can earn all of it and earn enough currency to, to buy the next battle pass. And so it encourages gameplay where you play and you earn the rewards. Whereas with Assassin's Creed Odyssey, it affects gameplay, but there's no way to earn that via gameplay. It's just something that's paywalled for an additional $10 for a feature that some might desire. Uh, even if you don't, uh, per se, that doesn't mean that there aren't people who do desire that, uh, who, who think that the game would be better off with that XP booster activated. And I don't think them expressing anger over that necessarily uh, is unjustified or is uh, sort of... They're not saying it's as bad as Battlefront 2, but they're also not going to say, hey, this is acceptable either. So to think, just say I it's think, an annoyance is yeah, downplaying I mean, that. When you say express anger, I mean, I think that's one of the real fundamental problems mm-hmm. with the game industry right now is anger and this rage that is just cultivated and instilled and is just so constantly ubiquitous mm-hmm. in the video game industry. This rage, this anger, like, oh my god, the $60 game that happens to be uh, one of the best Assassin's Creeds by far, like this incredible open world RPG that is like so well designed and full of interesting stuff and humongous. You can spend 200 hours playing this. It is... Uh, would you agree with me when I say that the video game industry right now and the quality of video games is as high as it's ever been? For certain games, yes. For others... In general. I'm just saying in general. I'm not saying... I, I know there are some series that are in the yeah. shitter. I'm not I'm not arguing that point. But I'm saying in general. Right now, if you go into Steam, the number of games you can play... I mean, everyone's always talking mm-hmm. about their backlogs, their Steam backlogs. And um, right now, I mean, I just finished Red Dead Redemption 2, which is yeah. absurd. Yeah, of course. Um, and now I'm moving on to Return of the Obra Dinn and Hitman 2 and all these other games mm-hmm. that I want to play. We're at this point where video games are an incredible place. Yeah, the fidelity is these, amazing. Uh, and their graphical fidelity, yeah. they're hitting all these artistic bars, mm-hmm. yeah. yet at the same time, there's so much rage. Yeah. And to me, it's like looking at a game like Assassin's Creed Odyssey, it's $60. For $60, you are getting so much more mm-hmm. and so much a better game than so many of the things. Like, if you look back, I don't know how long you have been following the video game industry, but if you look back even eight years ago, ten years ago, mm-hmm. at the types of games that were being released for the same exact price, it is like like beyond belief how much better this is in every way, quantity and quality right and so we're at this point where it's 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 hard for me to accept that there should be rage about these things like okay you want to get annoyed that this game is an xp booster fine you want to get annoyed that this game has this annoying microtransaction and it's just like like should not be there it ruins the, the integrity of the game i i am with you there 100 percent. but i think when you turn that into like i am now going to spend four hours a day in the comments on youtube and reddit screen or, or social media screaming at developers and just getting upset about every new controversy week after week i think that is where you hit a point where i mean for me it's incomprehensible but here's the thing. How do you change a, a circumstance like Battlefront 2 without an outrage? I mean, do you think that EA would have backpedaled on things like Battlefield 5, uh, with, with, which has no loot boxes, or Anthem, which they say will have no loot boxes? FIFA still does, but, you know. Uh, w- would you say that backpedaling would have happened without some think, sort of no, outcry? No, see, I think that is, yeah, I think there are times when it is justify to go out and be like you know what i'm going to start this this consumer movement together i think the xbox drm was a very good example of a way that a group of people who are really upset and want to stop something can mm-hmm. get together and do that but even then it was like with battlefront 2 the the level of discourse that i saw it's just like it goes beyond like here i am a passionate person and mm-hmm. i am really against this and it just goes into i mean i've looked at your youtube comments like it's the the level of discourse discourse that you have is different than the the anger and rage and outrage and and just toxicity that I'm seeing expressed by people. And I think that is a real problem. And I think people like you and me with a platform, I think one of our responsibilities, because we speak to these big audiences, is to say, hey, like maybe you don't need to be so angry. Maybe that anger is is not really healthy for anybody. And for me personally, and we mm-hmm. will probably get into this, but something that I find really concerning, I 
I am someone who really deeply cares about video games. I, I really I. want, yeah. love video games, want them to be better. Um, and I am also someone who talks to a lot of people who make video games. That's not corporations. That is not uh, the the corporate shill mm-hmm. conversation. Right. Which yeah. Can well, also I don't. Have. Yeah, I'm not. I'm but, not subscribing to that either. Well, yeah. but I, I want to get into that. But but I talk to a lot of people who make video games, right? And the most common thing I hear from people who make video mm-hmm. games is this sense of like like just resounding apathy and burnout and just this sense that like people just want to leave the video game industry and that's not entirely because of this outrage thing but outrage is certainly a factor i mean uh, other th- there are other reasons layoffs and uh, crunch and underpay and all sorts of other issues that are all just part of the, that can all be single-handedly traced to these executives at big game right. publishers but the outrage, I think, is very real and is a very real problem. And I think that's something that that people like you and I need to be a little concerned about and think about when we are talking to people is like, what is this coming from? Is it necessary? What sorts of effects is it having on people beyond these like short-term victories, quote unquote, like Battlefront 2 changing its ways? What sorts of net long-term effects is this outrage going to have? And that's something that really deeply concerns right. me. Right. Well, first of all, we are angry. I am angry because I I had much more passion for games that I, when I play them 10 years ago than I do now. I remember when I used to look forward to the Assassin's Creed, the Star Wars Battlefronts, and all these different franchises. And now, every time I go into E3 and look forward to an EA conference, I'm thinking, what's the catch? Like, that's that's the my, my train of thought right now. And here's the thing, consumers, you have so much knowledge on uh, insider knowledge and what goes on and why things work the way they do. Consumers don't have that. And, the, you know, you know uh, and... Well, they could. I, I think one of the reasons that some people don't have it is because they don't want to learn. And uh, no, they do. Frank, but I think, but, but game companies that... can communicate better. I think it's just that there's can, such a disparity course. in communication, and yeah. it's oh yeah, 100%. maddening. No, I, I'm totally with you there. I mean, I think mm-hmm. games, PR, and marketing teams, and the way that they communicate with people is just infuriating. Mm-hmm. I've railed against all sorts of right. companies for their ch- terrible communication in various mm-hmm. ways. But um, there is a level of knowledge out there that I think you, you, your average gamer could certainly of course. reach. Um, and I actually think that, and this is not pointing fingers at you, but mm-hmm. I do think that one of the problems is that a lot of YouTube videos are very much in like designed in a way where it's someone talking about things, sometimes talking about things they don't really understand, making guesses, maybe reading things they saw on Reddit, mm-hmm. and kind of spreading this level of misinformation. And I think that's a real problem. Um, when you say that you're angry, I find that really interesting because uh, didn't we just agree that video games are in this great place? I mean, I, I, I get you on like like EA conferences uh, uh, are the most, I mean, I cover, I run our news team for Kotaku, mm-hmm. so we have to cover all the yeah, news sure. that comes out of them. And EA's conferences might be like the most terrifying, like terrible, like boring. Yeah. Oh my god! I mean, I can't believe they turned Command and Conquer into mm-hmm, a mobile mm-hmm. game. Like that bummed me out. Mm-hmm. Um, that they feel like they're designed for investors. But mm-hmm. I mean, that is like uh, <laughs> that is a capitalism problem. That is a publicly traded company problem where these executives at the right. top are making right. many millions of dollars in order yeah. to make this stuff. Um, and I, 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 I get you. Um, But for me, I mean, I find it hard to get angry about these things because I'm looking at my Steam desktop right now, like I'm on my my desktop right now, and I'm looking at these all these shortcuts to games that I cannot wait to play. I'm looking at what Star Wars Battlefront 2 could have been and what it ultimately wasn't. That's what I'm looking at because I love Star Wars, but we're not going to get a proper Battlefront 2 because, well, EA fucked that up, didn't they? Um, And similar, you know, yeah, I've I've got my... my, uh, my, my game franchises that that are still on course. The red games like Red Dead Redemption Two, phenomenal. God of War, my personal game of the year. Uh, all these different games, yeah, and they remind me. Oh my God, yeah, this is why I love games. But then I see other franchises owned by these other companies take a certain course. You know, even if it's inching or if it's just swerving all the way through. And I'm thinking what that could have been, and 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 just the lack of 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 listening to the community. And I understand that that it's not as simple as that that there are sort of financial elements that they have to meet, you know, financial guidelines and all that, but there has to be a better balance, don't you agree? Mm-hmm. 
Like, yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, I think actually Diablo Immortal, let's segue to Diablo Immortal because I think that's a perfect example of this. And yeah, I mean, you look at that and you look at the anger and rage. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of that anger is misguided. And I think a lot of that anger only exists because of Blizzard's terrible Mm -hmm. marketing and PR strategy and the fact that they decided to end the BlizzCon keynote on that game, which is Mm -hmm. inexplicable to me. Um, and so what I had heard and reported, as mm-hmm. I, I know that you saw, yes. is that they were planning on announcing Diablo 4. Blizzard has disputed that. Mm-hmm. I mean, I know for a fact that they made this video where Alan Adam, the executive vice president or whatever his title mm-hmm. is, talks about like, hey, we have this new Diablo, we have new Diablo games in the works. And they've hinted very strongly that they have Diablo 4 in the works. They do, I can tell you that mm-hmm. for a fact. Yeah. Um, but the fact that they are so like, like sticking to the script for PR and marketing, like, we cannot talk about this game until right. it's ready to talk about. Right. And the fact that they couldn't even say, mm-hmm. like, yeah, Diablo 4 is in development, that is just them Baffling. just shooting themselves in both yeah. feet at once. Mm-hmm. Um, but all that said, it's like, to to get so angry because Blizzard made a phone game that is clearly meant to mm-hmm. p- make money in China, is that also seems like just, I, I, I can't understand it because not every game that Blizzard makes is going to be for me. And I've accepted mm-hmm. that a long time ago. I don't play Heroes of the Storm. I have no interest in that game. Sure. And I'm probably not going to care about Diablo Immortal because like, yeah. it doesn't look great. Well, I think you're generalizing the crowd um, because not everyone is in the in the page of I want a Diablo four. It's or rather like like they didn't necessarily expect Diablo four, but it's just that the the tone deafness that happened there is I think what mainly our people are angry about. I hear less people complaining about why wasn't Diablo four shown. We wanted gameplay. We wanted a trailer. It was less that and more of a how did you think that. Like you said at first, like it's baffling that this kind of this level of communication, and the from what I hear at least from and that's sort of what I the information that I presented, I don't care that a mobile Diablo game exists. I just think the tone deafness of this BlizzCon and with everything that's going on right now, it paints this perception and perception is such an important thing that are they losing their way, you know? And perhaps that's not uh, that's it's too premature to say something like that. Absolutely. But when Blizzard presents themselves that way, and when the, the next day it's more about mobile, all of our IPs were working on mobile. And that, I know that doesn't necessarily mean that we are not going to get Diablo 4 and, or, or that it's going to detract from that. But I mean, when that's the, the focus of the conversation at a celebration event, uh, a fan event like BlizzCon, I mean, yeah, I, th- I think, you know, the, the the quote I have here, is this an out-of-season April Fool's joke? Mm-hmm. You know, for me, not an unreasonable thing to ask uh, at all. So, okay, so here is where we get into the point that I wanted to make. Sure. So, do you know who Wyatt Chang is? The guy who was on stage? The principal when designer. Yeah, so Wyatt Chang, um, I don't know him. I've interviewed mm-hmm. him once, but I don't really know him as a person. Mm-hmm. But I know that he has been working on Diablo for something like 15 years. Mm-hmm. He was involved in Diablo 3 all the way through its mm-hmm. like development hell, and he was on that project for a mm-hmm. very long time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What I've heard from people at Blizzard, and this is secondhand, sure. so take that with, sure. With, sure. with whatever grains of salt you need, is that he, after Diablo 3 wanted a break. And I think that's the sense you get from a lot of people at Blizzard. Mm-hmm. They wanted a little break from these 10-year development hell cycles, right? Mm-hmm. So he mm-hmm. says, you know what? What can I do that would be a really a much shorter development cycle? It might take a couple of years or like a year instead of 10 years, right? Mm-hmm. So he goes to a mobile game because that's the answer to that question sure. is if you want to do shorter projects, you make mobile games, right? And it happens to be that Blizzard wants to team up with NetEase and make this game for China and mm-hmm. works out nicely. Wyatt Chang the poor guy is put on stage yeah. and, like to represent this game yeah. after years and years of hard work making things that Diablo fans love mm-hmm. he is forced to stand on stage and yeah. take these questions from this guy and i get it i get that this guy like and and the the blizzard fans this is all they had to talk to they can't be like sending emails to bobby kodak mm-hmm. but like why can't they be talking about the people at Activision who are taking home Bobby Kodak's bonus last year was, I believe, $28 million. Wyatt Chang yeah. is not making that kind of money. Yeah, for sure. Um, if it, it, it just feels so misguided. It feels like, and by the way, that April Fool's joke, a lot of people have been like, like blasting me because I tweeted that that April Fool's joke was, like, was like uh, petulant and whatever. Yeah. yeah. Petulant. Mm-hmm. Um, people act like, 
again, it's the Twitter problem. Mm-hmm. People look at that tweet and they're like, oh my god, look at Jason's thoughts mm-hmm. etched in zone. He's defending Blizzard without actually like reading or listening to anything I'm actually saying about Diablo Immortal. So mm-hmm. that's too bad. But because like I don't think this was a big deal. It was a stupid joke. I thought it was dumb and immature, but I don't really care that much about this guy asking a question on stage. Well, you, but you I replied do to that, one user. You basically told him like like if if you think this is okay, you can like fuck off. And yeah, I mean that's a problem with Twitter is that sometimes you'll be like angry about something, and then twenty minutes later you'll be like, oh whatever, I don't care anymore. But it's still etched in stone for everyone to see that you said fuck off to someone. Mm-hmm. And I, I mean that's that's. A problem and maybe something I should be better at dealing mm-hmm. with, but that but that's another story. Sure. Um, the point that I was trying to make is that like when people get this mad about Blizzard and Wyatt Chang and even just the idea of Blizzard, why aren't people sending mass letters to Bobby Kotick? Why aren't people making, give us his email? Right? Give us his email address. Why don't you send? Why don't? Why don't? Where's the letter mailing campaign to Activision HQ saying that? Yeah, fans that... don't want the CEO of Activision mm-hmm. making a twenty-eight million dollar bonus based yeah. on the profit. That he's generating from these ridiculous microtransactions for sure, for and sure. I think that that oftentimes, like that's what makes me angry. Mm-hmm. You want to talk sure. about anger? Sure, it doesn't make sure. me angry that Blizzard's making Diablo Immortal. It makes me angry that Bobby Kotick is making twenty yeah. eight million dollar bonuses Absolutely. while his employees are like crunching their asses off to make games for him. Hell yeah! And yeah. That I think. I, I mean, really, <laughs> what 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 a lot of people might not even realize is that they're angry at just like capitalistic structures yeah, in much, general. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. But yeah, I mean, that's what really is like, like, I don't know, I, maybe I just feel like the rage is misguided, mm-hmm. maybe I just feel like the rage is, is maybe I've gotten too old and I just don't understand <laughs> sure. why people can get so mad when there's uh-huh. so many great video games. I, I think it's a lot of things for me. No, I, 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 see, I see what you mean uh, from that perspective, but I think from the gamers, I, I think the reason they're so kind of um, sometimes direct and anger at you is because it, it feels like uh, you're... You're basically telling gamers to fuck off, and then when when the companies do stuff like Battlefront, telling one person to fuck off. Okay, yeah, yeah, but Ah. but but you know, like uh, calling this man who basically asked a question at a Q and A panel. That yeah, it was rude, but I personally don't think it was petulant. I think it it was an expression of I'm baffled, and I think in a public, but it wasn't a big deal. I mean, I think that that like I mean, I don't care that much about this guy and what he said. I just thought he was no, yeah, but he was mm -hmm. just. Rub me the wrong way. Sure, sure. Uh, but my point is, it, I guess it for some gamers, it feels like the gamers rub you in the wrong way. But these, it's like when when you talk about like the Battlefront two loot boxes, it almost feels like you just give him a a tap on the wrist, say they could do better. And then, but with the gamers, it's like, oh, you guys are acting like fools or immaturely, and it feels just from what's out there. It feels very skewed. Like it, it's I like think there's it more. Feels that way there's more anger towards actually... the gamer than there is towards the the corporations and the or the the some of the game business models. Yeah, I mean, I think people who would see things that way just don't actually follow my work and maybe just saw a Yang Ye video that was about one of my tweets. Because anyone who follows my work knows that for years and years I have been. Uh, just railing against corporations for all sorts of reasons, for especially for the way that they treat the people who work for them, the way that the crunch system, the the way that crunch practices just destroy people, just chew them up and spit them out. Um, I've written, I mean, I yeah, wrote no, a book of course, about this. No, I, I know all about that. Yeah. New York Times. I mean, so, so I mean, I, I, I think that. Anyone who follows my work would see how preposterous it is to think that I defend corporations in any way. I do think that it's important to look at these things and to wonder, like, hey, how did these decisions get made? Why are these decisions getting made? How can I advance the conversation in a productive way? Mm -hmm. Um, And I don't think the answer to that is the sheer rage and posting in your YouTube comments about cucks and SJWs and all the other things that I have seen. Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, I don't disagree with you there. Um, But at the same time, when you're not helping by just going out there and Calling a guy who was baffled petulant, or by by making it seem like you're this I mean, guy. He was petulant. I'm, I'm not going to take that back. Uh, we can disagree on that, sure. but again, it's not a. I don't think it's a big deal that this guy was like mm-hmm. this. This dude was like said something obnoxious. I right, mean, but you, you're it, very at the end angry. of the day, it doesn't matter yeah. that much mm-hmm. unless. But if you're like uh, what what I think about is if. If you are Wyatt Chang and mm-hmm. you have just like put out, put, been put out there by your company mm-hmm. and just taken all this this abuse, and mm-hmm. now I bet when people Google his name, like this is the first thing that comes up. 
that instead sucks, of years yeah. and years of hard work. Mm-hmm. Um, I just see that happen constantly. Yeah, and for sure. I see people, I just hear, I hear people who are talented, experienced game developers saying, what am I doing? Like, why am I mm-hmm, working mm-hmm. for these people who seem to hate me? Mm-hmm. And I think there, it, there's a reputation and there's a feeling um, for but like whether this is true or not, but there is a feeling among the people who make video games that they are making games for an audience that detests them and is just looking for any reason to watch them fail. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a real problem. But, and I think that mm-hmm. that's something that people like you could do to alleviate that is to make sure that everything that you say and I say and all of us say who mm-hmm. are, are mm-hmm. in these positions where we have platforms is comes from a place that is accurate and true and fair. And that last word is especially important, fair. Um, for example, something that I think is very unfair is taking Mark Dara, who's the producer of Anthem, mm. and taking his interview from that was like a lighthearted Game Informer interview mm. where he talks mm. about Mass Effect Andromeda, a game that he didn't even work on, and says that he answers a question like, do you think that got a fair shot? And he says no, because it was released the same month that, at Zelda. I think taking that and like attacking him over it feels very unfair to me because here's this guy who is representing his other game, is not involved with that with Mass Effect and Drama at all, is asked a question, answers that question in the best way that he thinks he can, and then is suddenly seen as the face of like everything wrong with Bioware. I think that that is the type of thing that I think winds up turning a lot of game developers off, making a lot of people feel like, oh my god, there's just so much anger and hatred in this mm-hmm. industry. Yeah. And I just feel like, like I, I don't want to tell you how to do your job, but I do feel like it's really important for people like us to just feel the sense of responsibility. And don't get me wrong, I fuck things up all the time. Sure, yeah. I do not, mm-hmm. I am not perfect in any way. I yeah, get things I, wrong constantly. But I think that just trying to hold yourself to certain standards when it comes to that and just not be part of the problem when it comes to this outrage, um, I think is important. Yeah, for sure. Uh, but consequently, I, I think... When game journalists just sort of generalize gamers as these, you know, like, oh, these angry animals or whatever. Because, um, yeah, I, I know that you did write these articles for uh, against some of these corporations and these practices, but they're very mm-hmm. succinctly put. You talk, it's very meticulous and uh, you, you go into a lot of detail. But then when you look at a guy who you know, ask the question at a Q&A panel, it's he's petulant, period. That's it. There's no, you, you don't, you don't give any sort of additional articulation on that front. Whereas with these issues, you kind of look at every angle. And then with the gamers, it's like, they're just petulant or they're just entitled. Yeah, or, I mean, or, I think or somebody problem, else said that. I don't know. Well, I mean, you're just, when you look at a tweet versus actual reporting, yeah, but, but stories, a tweet matters. A it does matter. Like in the same way that your articles are looked at, so are your tweets. It's a public forum. You no, know, yeah, what I tweet I has I mean, don't get me wrong. No, no, no. Well. Don't get me wrong. Twitter is the worst thing ever invented. I mean, I, 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 I see what you're saying. Uh-huh. And yeah, I mean, that's something that I have to reckon with mm-hmm. is realizing that when I tweet a stray thought on the subway, I actually wrote that tweet like oh. while I was just looking at videos on the subway and mm-hmm. just watching it. I was like, oh my God, this is stupid. Um, I, I have to realize that that is Mm-hmm. given the same weight as what mm-hmm. I published on Kotaku to a certain level subject, a uh, subset of my audience. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I totally understand that. Um, but I do think that that even though there's like suddenly this this perspective, mm-hmm. and I think it's a, it's a lot of it comes from your audience that I am this corporate chill who's defending Blizzard and defending uh, uh, what was the other one? Uh, Ubisoft for Assassin's Creed Odyssey and and like uh, and then the Bethesda thing, the Bethesda right. engines thing. I think that 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 perspective is just so out of whack, especially I, the Bethesda thing. I don't disagree. Um, considering they have haven't talked to me in five years, um, but I think I, I I've been thinking about like why that is and how that came about, and I think a lot of it is people just seeing my tweets or seeing a single article without mm-hmm. being familiar with my body of work, and I I totally understand that. I don't expect everyone to mm-hmm. just be like researching every single thing that I've sure. written. Right. Um, I I think that what maybe what what some people aren't understanding and maybe what uh, a point that i wanted to bring up to you mm-hmm. is that i don't really see like like everything i do is to serve my audience whether mm-hmm. it is people who are hardcore video gamers who check kotaku every single day check my twitter feed every single mm-hmm. day whatever it is or people who are casual mm-hmm. gamers or people who don't care about games or just like reading kotaku for mm-hmm. whatever reason my job is to serve every single one of those people it is like like that is what i do every day for a full time job that is i go to my office and write things and report and do things that are serving those people so 
like, I don't feel the need to get on a soapbox and be like, gamers' rights, consumers, stand up, because I feel like everything I am doing is for those people. I My job is to entertain and inform those people. Right. So I guess I just see this yeah. in a different light than sure. other people might. Like, I, I don't really think that I need to be, like, standing up for the gamers. No, I, um, but I think you you need to address them as equals and not just as these, ah, oh, these, these guys, these, these, um, you know, like, because that's what it feels well, like, when, even if it's not your intention, it does. When, uh, when did it feel that way, other than the calling the dude petulant? I mean, there is, uh, multi, uh, I can't think of it right now, but there were yeah, multiple. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I think that I see what you're saying, mm. and I think that it can come across that way maybe when you're looking at it from a perspective of like i'm one of you i'm gonna get mad and share all your theories and read reddit posts and that sort of thing as opposed to like hey here i'm in a position and this is something that i take very seriously but i'm an i am in a position sure. where i can talk to people and get answers to questions that your average mm -hmm. audience not and i take that really seriously and think it's really important and i mean if people see that as me standing on a high horse because i felt like it needed to be explained what a game engine actually is because no, that you no, were no, so misused. Yeah. I mean, that that's like something that people were saying. They're like, oh my God, look at this Jason being sanctimonious here. Right. I think that's ridiculous. I mean, I think it's my job to try to explain things sure. to my audience. Yeah. And I think that uh, people who read Kotaku, the millions of readers that we have, know and appreciate that. And I guess what I would say to your audience is, if you really feel like I am anti-gamer, I am no. for you to read my body I of never, work. I never, ever, I don't know if uh, you actually, I've never said that, in fact. Uh, no, I know, you're very video. complimentary of me, and I appreciate that, but I have certainly seen what your audience says. Right, no, of course, but, YouTube you know, post. and consequently, your audience, when you, you know, say, you know, the YouTube provocateur young, yeah, consequently, they come to me and say you're the Alex Jones of... A video game news essentially no that's ridiculous right but I, but see I I, that... I, I, unfortunately this is i well i yeah, hate that well, it is yeah, this me, way it is internet say, culture just, yeah but i want to say i i mean i did not call you a provocateur like like willy-nilly like i chose sure. that word deliberately and i think that what you do and i have a lot of respect for the the strives you may you've made as a mm -hmm. youtube video i've been watching your videos for a long right. time i have a lot of respect for you i i think you work very hard i think you do some really good stuff but i also think that when you make videos that do provoke people and i think a lot of your videos are designed that way or at least they're packaged that way because i think you speak very calmly and rationally and oftentimes you try to present things in a really rational way but when you make videos that have certain inflammatory titles and then when they say certain inflammatory things or even just ask questions that might come from a place of bad information I think that winds up provoking people and stoking the flames of outrage in a way that I think is is can can be very dangerous. And I'm not telling you this because I think you should quit and, and go live on a farm in Utah. I think that I, I'm telling you this and I'm on your show because mm -hmm. I think that having constructive criticism can just sure. make us all better. Absolutely. Um, for an example, and, and I want to bring up the example that we were talking about on Twitter yeah, because yeah. I feel like just tweeting about it wasn't, yeah, I mean, wasn't. Twitter's a garbage website. It's yeah. not a good place to have a conversation. Right. Um, I, when you said, when you asked that question, like, is it, is it possible that, uh, I'm paraphrasing, I don't have it in front of me, sorry, but is it possible that Blizzard making Diablo Immortal is detracting from their other games? I know that you were just asking the question that a lot of fans are asking, mm -hmm. but I think when you're in a position, when you're speaking to hundreds of thousands of people, doing that is the same as, 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 as spreading misinformation. It's like saying, uh, not that I think you're anything like Alex Jones, but it's as if Alex Jones were on his video saying, I'm just asking questions. Was Obama born in America? We don't right. know. I'm just asking questions. But it come on, like, there's a repeated pattern of certain things happening. I mean, companies who get a taste of the lucrative nature of mobile, you know, will either shift towards more mobile games or even model their AAA games after mobile. I'm not pulling things out of thin air. I'm not saying 9-11 no, no, was a yes. conspiracy. 
trust me, I, I hear you and you're totally right. And I think that like based on my reporting and uh, uh, just a little bit of a teaser, I have been reporting a lot on Diablo Immortal and mm-hmm. what's going on with Diablo. Mm-hmm. And you should expect an article in the near sure. future about all that stuff. All right. But but based on my reporting, trust me, we have reasons that like there are questions to ask about Blizzard. That mm-hmm. is for sure. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. Activision's influence on Blizzard, the fact that their CEO just left, their well-respected, right, right. beloved CEO. There are a lot of questions to be asked. Don't get me wrong. But I think you have to ask them from a position of of education and not just stoking like what people are believing on Reddit and not just like conveying the common misconceptions. And I think that one of them is like, oh, well, they said they have all their best people working on mobile games. That's not entirely true. I mean, first of all, uh, I think that when Alan Adams said that, he was saying it as a kind of one of those expressions where it's like, oh, yeah, we have some of our best people doing it. Not literally like we have our best developers of the company doing mm-hmm. this because that's not I mean, that's that would be ridiculous for him to say it's insulting and the rest of it people. It was more of a turn of phrase. But second of all, I think that what you like what you might not know and I don't expect you to know this, but Blizzard has an incubation team and that is where their mobile games are coming out of and it's very different from their Team 1, Team 2, Team 3, Starcraft mm-hmm. team, Diablo mm-hmm. team, etc. Um, they're just totally different structures. So mm-hmm. them doing Diablo Immortal just by definition is going to have nothing to do with their Diablo right. 4 project. And I don't expect you to know that. But Why I can't they that communicate that? During because during the Q&A panel. Because, right, because that's what I mean. That's what well, I mean. Look, don't get me wrong. I mean, I've spoken about this. I've been writing about this for mm. years. If you actually, if you look back, maybe don't look back because I'm kind of embarrassed of, of this article <laughs> right. now, but I wrote something in 2012, actually, about how one of the biggest problems in gaming is that game developers aren't talking. And it's totally right. true that, like, uh, I mean, one of the reasons that I have to use anonymous sources constantly is because mm. all these people have signed NDAs and right. they can't talk about things. And that's, that's right. horrible. Yeah. And there's so many stories in games that we are just never going to uh-huh. hear because of these fucking NDAs. Yeah. But, uh, trust me, I'm as pissed off about that as anything. Mm-hmm. Like, talk about rage. That's what makes me angry. But that said, I think that it is our position, and I know that you have the capability of doing stuff like this. It, it's just our position in general. Mm-hmm. And don't get me wrong, it's not just you. It's like, I see this from regular journalists. I see this from all sorts of people on the internet just making up these theories or, like, mm-hmm. guessing and, mm-hmm. and speculating just based on nonsense. But it's our responsibility to just be, like, trying to find ways to actually answer those questions or at the very least asking questions that are from a more like informative perspective and asking these questions in a way that doesn't stoke outrage if we don't really know what the answers are Um, I think it's really important to do that especially when we have these huge platforms and we really just like owe something to our audience we owe uh, the we have this responsibility to our audience to make sure that they are kept informed and not just like, like allowing these opinions to keep spreading that are just totally off base um the i mean the blizzard thing is just one example i trust me i've seen this from t- so many different people it is it, it just rubs me the wrong way when people are like just just looking for controversy after controversy and just looking for things to get mad about it and just i'm people. looking for for respite from all this crap <laughs> is what i'm looking for uh yeah i mean I, i'm with you there like uh, like it like i i don't like it, it feels good to get this out because I, f- yeah, like, yeah, I do, I do make a lot of like, oh, is this what's happening? I, I don't understand. Like, what is going on? Um, and that's, yeah, it's not always uh, the healthiest thing to do. But it's just like, I don't know what else to say because uh, there is no communication. Uh, you know why CD Projekt Red, I think, is so, uh, like, like, few people, like, say, shit about CD Projekt Red, um, and that's because they communicate. They actually do that. I, there was one video posted by this YouTuber called Pretty Good Gaming, and mm-hmm. he basically kind of took a quote from, they, they took a quote from the, from some investors meeting, and they, they, they kind of went, wait a minute, that sounds like there might be microtransactions or something in Cyberpunk 2077. Um, and so that stoked, like, like, as you said, and I'm not, this is not a diss, but I'm just trying to, you know. Yeah, I remember this. Yeah, right. And, and then they said, um, yeah, like, like maybe there's microtransactions in Cyberpunk 2077. CD Projekt Red responded like the next day, saying, "Okay, here's here's what's what's happening with that," uh, and they they explained everything and they said, "But in the end, you know, we we talk investors this way, but Cyberpunk 2077, no microtransactions is going to be like Witcher 3, free DLCs, the bite-sized DLCs, and big expansions. This same format, we can assure you, boom, just like that, that outrage." 
died. There was no more of that, and and it was just an an, uh, an immediate relief. Mm-hmm. Why can't more game companies do that? I, I, yeah, I guess in I large mean, part the publishers and the NDAs and whatever. Yeah, I mean the problem is that it's like these publicly traded companies. I mean sometimes they will say that in I mean in Poland mm-hmm. there's no SEC rules. Mm-hmm. The SEC in America actually prevents what game publishers that are publicly mm-hmm. traded, EA and Activision, actually prevents what they can mm-hmm. say sometimes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, as far as like what's coming in the future, like sometimes right. they're literally legally prevented. Mm-hmm. But yeah, totally. I mean a lot of this is. Uh, I've been following the video game industry for a very long time. Mm-hmm. A lot of this mm-hmm. is just this uh, these antiquated practices where it's mm-hmm. like it used to be back in the day. It was just like every single data point of a game was just like carefully doled out. It's like, okay, this month we're putting out the screenshots. This month we're telling everybody how many guns there mm-hmm. are in the game. And it was just this mm-hmm. so controlled. Um, and it's also it was also the point where, like, I mean, 30 years ago it was just video game magazines and they mm-hmm. just existed to sell ads mm-hmm. on these games and mm-hmm. write previews right. and uh, just puff up everything. And there mm-hmm. were some of them were literally run by game publishers like Nintendo Power. And right. that was a different world it's gotten much better now mm-hmm. and we've gotten to the point where there are journalists and outlets who are independent and they're mm-hmm. they're fighting the good fight fight and making sure that these publishers are kept in check a little bit mm-hmm. um and i think that's really important but to uh some extent the pr people have not kept up with that right and that's one of the reasons that bethesda thinks it's okay to just blacklist an outlet for five years is because right. they believe in this world where they control mm-hmm. every single mm-hmm. game company or game outlet mm-hmm. and if the game outlet isn't behaving they they got to keep them in line they got to keep them away mm-hmm. um so yes, I, I I mean you're 100 percent right. This idea of like this veil of secrecy over the video game industry mm-hmm. is one of the biggest problems, and mm-hmm. that's something that I've been trying to fight against for a very right. long time. It's one of the reasons that I, I I do some of the things that I do and report some of the things mm-hmm. that I report. Um, but yeah, I mean that's that said, there is there are rooms for these conversations and questions that can be asked that I think aren't don't contribute to the problems. I think there are ways to have these conversations and there are even ways to like get upset about things or get annoyed about things without just like turning it into outrage after outrage after outrage, fight after fight after fight. I mean, look, the the Bethesda creation engine thing is actually a perfect example mm-hmm. because it's like this this whole conversation started based on a quote from June that was then taken by Forbes in an article about game engines and then rediscovered like two weeks after the Forbes mm-hmm. article. It was ridiculous. It was like this this harmless quote that was like, yeah, we've changed a lot and now we're, we're keeping our editor, but mm-hmm. we've changed everything else that's part of our engine. And it just turned into this just giant circle jerk of ignorance. And I get it. I get that it's because Fallout 76 just came out and it looks like garbage and it yeah. runs like Gar- like yeah. jank, um, and it raises questions about the yeah. technology, and I think those are legitimate questions. But to turn that into headlines, and this is not just you by any mm-hmm. means, but to turn that into headlines that say Bethesda not changing its headline for uh, engine for Starfield and Elder Scrolls Six is just such nonsense. Like that is not a conversation that is worth having. The conversation that is worth having is like, why is this? game so buggy how did this happen is this should this be called early access uh should this be a 60 dollars game right now should this be something that we spend our money on we should play it and then talk about it and expose this and i think it's super important for people like you to keep talking about it and exposing it and being like look look at these bugs look at Mm -hmm. this bug that literally deletes the beta off of your machine that is absurd. Yeah. How could this ever be pub- like like how could this be shipped? How could this be shipped mm-hmm. to people's computers? That is ridiculous, mm-hmm. right? It's important to have those conversations, but when you start talking about like like Starfield and the Elder Scrolls 6 and how Bethesda is deciding for this game that won't come out till 2024, they're deciding now that they're not going to change their tech. Like that's if you think about that for even 30 seconds, it's it's preposterous. Like <laughs> Elder Scrolls 6 it very mel- well might have the same problems that other Bethesda games have and I think there are many conversations to be had about like why those games have so many problems and and yeah. what the root causes of those are but to even talk about like what tech they have for Elder Scrolls 6 now is like preposterous like they haven't yeah. even decided but when you look at again it's just there's such a repeated pattern of this if this were you know if Fallout 76 were like a fluke then people wouldn't be saying anything but it's just from a, from Morrowind to Oblivion to to Fallout 3 to Skyrim each time, oh, um, yeah. it's yeah, felt like, true. you know, 
so so when when that pattern keeps repeating itself, and then yeah, Todd Howard says something like uh, like that. It, it it's hard for people who've been like anticipating. Okay, when are we gonna get finally move forward with the technology? It's hard for them to to, to wonder or not to wonder. Are we going to just be stuck in this perpetual state of we're just going to keep getting buggy releases that are unacceptable at launch? Uh, the way like the way Fallout seventy six launched, unacceptable in my if you ask me. That I mean that's a good question and I think it should be asked when Starfield comes out in twenty twenty or whatever it is. I mean I think to just to have that conversation now is is premature and ridiculous because we don't even know what that game is. Like we don't know anything about it except for a title screen. I think it's more important to be looking at Fallout seventy six and be like, I mean the I questions th- that I have lots of questions about that game. First of all, yeah. how did it chip the way it did? How does mm-hmm, mm-hmm. why why is this not an early access game? Mm-hmm. Why is this not right. a beta? Yeah. Why is this not like being I mean, I don't know. I haven't played it, sure. so I shouldn't talk too much about it, but sure. just based on what I've seen. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then the other question that people should be asking is, like, why is... I haven't seen a lot of people talking about the fact that at the Video Game Awards in 2017, Bethesda's marketing team put out this video that was like, save single player! Mm-hmm. Look at us! We're making all these single player games! Mm-hmm. And then at E3 mm-hmm. this year, they announced Fallout 76 online game, they announced uh, Doom having... Uh, no, not Doom. It was Wolfenstein multiplayer, mm-hmm. Wolfenstein multiplayer... Uh, uh, a prey multiplayer mode. It was like all this multiplayer mm-hmm. stuff, and I, I haven't seen enough people calling out that hypo- hypocrisy <laughs> or many of the other hypocritical things that Bethesda does. Um, I think it's really important to keep talking about that and raising those things, not necessarily to get angry about them, because again, I don't think outrage is really justified a lot of no, the time. No, but but there is a room to express concern about the future. I think. Uh, sure, but to take a quote like that and extrapolate it to mean like Bethesda is not changing their ways; they're going to stick to their same old jankiness for these future games. We'll I mean, see. That to me is ridiculous. Like that's not even a story. That's like that's that's mm-hmm. not even. It's like half-assed hypothesis about what might happen in six years from now. And <laughs> yeah, I, I understand, but I like what YouTubers do in a, in a lot of respects is express how they feel about certain things, you know? And I, I know you're not necessarily all for that, but it's just, you know, I, feelings have to be, I think, compounded with knowledge. It has to be like a balance, I think. Yeah, and you're that's, absolutely that's... right. You're absolutely right. But it, when things keep happening and happening and happening, it's hard not to just go out there and be like, what is, ha-? like, is, what, what can we look forward to? Because right now it doesn't, something doesn't feel right, you know? Mm. Um, and I, I think a lot of changes in, in, in status quo happened because of people came out and said, this doesn't feel right. And again, I know it has to be compounded with knowledge. Absolutely. And which is why I think what you do is so important because but I, I guess uh, young, what I'm, what I'm not seeing here is that like, I mean, I get you when you say like, you're mm-hmm. upset about battlefront. I understand that I'm not a battlefront fan, so I personally don't care about that, but I am extremely upset that sweet Coden, which is this JRPG series mm-hmm. made by Konami mm-hmm. has been killed. And, and Konami is like, who knows yeah. what kind of pachinko machines right. they are making these days. And right. that, that hurt breaks my heart mm-hmm. that that series will never see another entry that, Mm-hmm. Like they released a PSP game in Japan that we never got in English, and and it just breaks my heart the way that they've treated that. It breaks my heart the way that Nintendo treats its classic games. A mm-hmm. lot of companies treat oh, yeah. their classic games, sure. but but it is so hard for me to get angry about any of the things that that are just annoying or depressing to me because when I look at my games of the year and what we mm-hmm. do at Kotaku is we each put together a list of mm-hmm. like our ten favorite games of the year, and I was thinking about like what are my ten, and uh, already it's it's November and I'm having trouble making a list. Of mm-hmm. 10 because I played so many incredible games this year. And for like sure. you're asking what, what there is to look forward at, and it's like, I mean, from no, for sure. Hollow Knight but, but, to but for, Into the Breach to but Bethesda, so many freaking games. Yeah, but Bethesda makes these amazing games that I loved growing up, right? And we want to see Bethesda succeed, specifically Bethesda. And so mm-hmm. it's not that I'm angry that there won't be anything down the line. I know there's so much to look forward to. I don't know what Death Stranding is, but I'm freaking curious as hell, and I'm looking forward to that, and I'm happy that I can still look forward to that. I but... thought you had like 400 theories about what it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, theories, but I still have no idea, honestly. But um, I can look forward to that and still be upset about oh, Bethesda. Can can we can we make pro or can express concern of can we make progress? Can we move past the the launches like Fallout seventy six and actually ship a product that 
that that will realize your full potential because Bethesda is a company with so much like imagination and 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 so much ambition and I love that. But So let me ask you something young. Have mm-hmm. you ever reached out to Bethesda and said, "Hey, I would like to talk to Todd Howard about this stuff?" Well, would he I mean, I've reached out to, you know, PR departments, but you know, what what they're not they're not going to Why would they let me speak to Todd Howard? Why not? I don't know. You a, yeah, because you have a YouTube channel. You have a popular YouTube would you, channel. Would you I be mean, able to connect me with them? And I'd, I'd love to no, speak with them. No, because Bethesda hasn't talked right. to me in five years. They, oh so. yeah, well there you go. <laughs> company for that. There you go. But, but the point is, I mean, I think that I, I hear you. I get it. I love Skyrim, mm. and then I was super disappointed by Fallout Four because right. suddenly they turned this incredible, like, nuanced series from right. Vegas to uh, to this like shoot fest where right. you can't even make more than four dialogue choices, and it's all just yeah. That, that game mm. really disappointed me, mm. and I. I hear you on that but but it's it's the type of thing where like Mm -hmm. i feel like the way to convey that opinion would Mm be a to criticize and make sure that people see like here's what you guys are doing wrong here's what you could be doing better but b to make sure that what i'm doing is not just like like perpetuating this outrage machine where it drives those talented Bethesda people to say, you know what, I work my ass off, I work mm-hmm. these 80 hour weeks sometimes to ship these games that are these ambitious like like RPGs that only we make that we just are working our asses off on mm-hmm. and then all I see is people getting angry and calling me a cuck on the internet about it. Mm-hmm. Like that to me is what really worries me and just anecdotally I hear all these stories about people who are just infuriated and, and burning out of the industry as a result of that and that is not to say that people shouldn't be criticizing because it's really important to criticize mm-hmm. and it's really important to keep talking about the bugs and mm-hmm. the problems with a game like Fallout 76 and from what I hear, I mean from what I've seen so far it looks like a pretty bad game and mm-hmm. I don't really know, it, it just feels like a misguided stab in the first place yeah. at, this, at this series, but it is important to do that without create without just like, like facilitating this outrage culture because I think that is really really bad for the video game industry and like it can hurt us in intangible ways that we might not even be aware of right like it but i don't know how to not express concern i i don't know how to not um you should express concern. I'm not telling you not to express. I, I think you should be totally honest with your feelings. You should yeah. you should keep telling your audience exactly how you feel. I mean, I think honesty yeah, no, is yeah, really important. Having that personal connection with your audience is really important. Mm-hmm. But all I'm asking, and this is not just you, but pretty much everybody, not like my colleagues, this is something mm-hmm. we talk about internally, is to just make sure, think about what you're saying. And here, actually, here's something that my boss, Stephen mm-hmm. Totillo, uh, tells me all the time. And sometimes mm-hmm. I don't take this advice and it always winds up backfiring. All right. w- what you are saying, either like in an article, in a podcast, on Twitter, in a video, mm-hmm. whatever else, would you say this to the face of the person you're talking about? And if the answer is no, reconsider what you're saying. And I think that is a really good way to be fair because Mm -hmm. you can be really critical Mm -hmm. about something, but if you say it in a way that is like, just imagine you're looking at the person in the eye and you're saying, look, this is how I feel about this, Mm -hmm. that automatically just like prevents you from turning into this just angry creature where you're just screaming and railing. Yeah, for sure. Um, and by the way, if I met Bobby Kotick, I would be like, how can you like sleep at night taking a $28 million <laughs> yeah. yearly bonus? Or, you know, uh, the, the folks uh, at EA, Andrew Wilson has a pretty big paycheck. Um, yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. It, it's, it is ridiculous. Th- that is, I mean, you want to talk about problems in the <laughs> yeah, video. Industry. for sure. That is the, the root problem is that Absolutely. these CEOs are making 400 times what their employees make. Mm-hmm. And their employees are slaving away and just like working their asses off on these games mm-hmm. and not seeing, I mean... Capitalism problems in general, <laughs> right? Yeah, capping sure. capping CEO pay and capping the the amounts uh, on these investors yeah. and. Man, if you want a real, the real story in the video game industry mm-hmm. is that like these companies, the way these companies operate is not based on like what is going to make us the most profit or well, it is. It's based on what's mm-hmm. the mo- going to make us the most profit, but it's not based on like like Activision does not have a successful quarter if they made money that quarter. What right. they need right. is to make more money exactly. than they made in, in yeah. the previous uh, year. Yeah, quarter. exactly. They're and in the business of financial growth. Like that. That's sort of the main thing really yes and that is the problem and that is the fundamental reason that we're seeing so many of these like mm-hmm, monetization mm-hmm. schemes that are so that feel mm-hmm, so like mm-hmm. like terrifying and horrible and and just dangerous mm-hmm. to us and and companies are just i mean that's what they need to do and this yeah. whole system is fundamentally yeah. flawed yeah and 
ultimately, I mean, I don't know what the solution is to that. Yeah, if man. I had it, I would right. be saying it. But right. Like, if you want to get mad at something, don't get mad at Wyatt Chang. Get mad at the, yeah. the way that publicly traded companies work. Yeah, I mean, I've, I was never mad at Wyatt Chang. I, uh, he handled it really well, all things considered, I think. But it, it sucks. Like, it, it sucks that he was put in that position. Um, but, but yeah, the, yeah. The, the re- all things considered, I absolutely agree that... The main thing to, to really be angry about, if there is something to be angry about, is absolutely the, the people at the top of the pyramid, you know, because mm-hmm. they ultimately direct Because they're not this. the ones who built that pyramid. Yeah, exactly. They're, yeah, they're not the ones who built that pyramid. Exactly. So, yeah, I, I we can see eye to eye there and hopefully, I, and the thing is, I don't know, how do I reach out to these folks and, you know, write, write a Yes, I don't know. And that's that's the thing. I think also they hide behind the veil while putting the game devs out there to take the brunt of the. Very true. Very true. Um, but I think you are in a position um, where where you could certainly be reaching out to mm-hmm. developers and and okay. talking to people and yeah. trying to get more uh, uh, informed answers to some sure. of your questions. Which I, I mean, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't want to tell you what to do again. But I, I would I, love nothing more than to no, do that, honestly. But it's just yeah. I mean, nothing uh, stopping him. Would, would you be able to? I don't know. Aid me a little bit and reach sure. out. Sure. You, let me know who you who you need, which company okay. you want contact information for, and I'll hook you up. Fair enough. Um, so I have, we've been talking for about an hour. Mm-hmm. I have a few more minutes if you want to talk about some of the questions, if you sure. want to pick any of these reader questions that you have. Um, now, I know you discussed uh, that we, you, we eventually want to get to the particular questions, but do, do you think we covered that enough or do you want to go back to that? Uh, the, um, like the game yeah, it's journalism? up to you, whatever, whatever you want. You, well, we, I, I think we... this one's really good and multiple, user, uh, multiple users ask okay. this. Where do you see the gaming industry in five years in terms of games, services, business models, so on? Is it Do you see good prospects, bad prospects, a mix of both? So, okay, so I think that when when these people are talking about the gaming industry and mm-hmm. when we talk about the gaming industry, mm-hmm. in general, we're talking about the big the big companies, mm-hmm. Activision and Ubisoft right. and EA and all these big companies. And I think they're all trending in this direction that we've watched for the past few years where it's like fewer games, more games as a service where it's got these models that are streaming. Every, excuse me, everyone wants their Fortnite. Um, everyone yeah, wants sure. to make a Fortnite. Um, Bobby Kotick is probably looking down at his employees and saying, "Why don't we have a Fortnite?" Oh yeah. Um, and and I mean, this is that inertia will continue mm-hmm. uh, even through net, new consoles and digital advancements and streaming and that sort of stuff. Um, what I'm excited about is just the the way that the independent game scene has just exploded mm-hmm. and yeah. created these incredible yeah. things. I mean, Hollow Knight. I mentioned this before. Mm-hmm. One of the best games I've ever played in my life. Mm-hmm. I played that this year on the Switch, and I was just blown away. Um, Into the Breach is one of my favorite games this year. I played Divinity Original Sin 2, oh, which is made God. by an independent yeah. studio. So- and so that good. is like the best isometric RPG. Mm-hmm. Probably beats Baldur's Gate 2 for me. Mm-hmm. Um, so that to me is really exciting. And I don't yeah. see that uh, stopping anytime yeah. soon, which is really cool to yeah. see. Uh, the thing I'm worried about is that if game developers don't, and I think this addresses one of the other questions, if game developers don't mm-hmm. find a way to combat uh, their shitty work conditions, ideally through unionization, because that's the only solution that I see, right. then I'm worried about like wide-scale burnout and uh, just yeah. the unsustainability of the current crunch practices. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. that's something, I mean, I would love to see, and I certainly would 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 be in favor of game developers unionizing within the next five years. Mm-hmm. So hopefully we'll see that. Um, do, you think, you know, do you think we're making headways towards that? Do you think it's... There's, been, there's certainly been, I don't know if there's headways, I haven't heard of any sure. companies actually making an effort to do mm-hmm. it yet, but there's been more conversation about it this year than ever mm-hmm. before. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that just at GDC of this year, the game developer conference in San Francisco there was mm-hmm. a lot of momentum talking about it there's a group called Game Workers Unite that mm-hmm. has popped up and started trying to get mm-hmm. grassroots organization efforts going so there's certainly more sure. uh, these days uh, yeah. than, more momentum than we've ever seen I before. think especially after what happened with uh, Telltale I think there's mm-hmm. been uh, more of a a conversation yeah, surrounding it. Um, yeah, like, because it's not like, I mean, a union couldn't have made Telltale or couldn't have prevented Telltale from shutting down, mm-hmm. but a union could have ensured that they got paid severance and they mm-hmm. weren't all just left on the street without anything, mm-hmm. which is what happened. Mm-hmm. Um, and a union could have put uh, one of the game developers in the negotiation room and just had given them a seat at the table, which I think is is the best way to ensure that the the big CEOs at the top of the pyramid aren't making every single decision without at least a little bit of input from the people who are at the bottom. Mm-hmm. I, yeah. Uh, 
I, I agree with all of that. Uh, now, uh, this question I, I find interesting. Goulash from YouTube says, uh, or he asks us to talk a bit about uh, PS, uh, or not the PS5 rumors, and but mainly the Sony not appearing at E3 uh, 2019. Uh, what do you mm -hmm. overall make of that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting. I, I, I assume, so I, I know that they've still got at least a couple of PS4 things left in the works mm. that they haven't announced yet. Yeah. Um, but I do think that there's the bulk of their show would have been uh, the games we saw last Ghost Death of Tsushima Stranding and Last of Us yeah. 2 and Ghost of Tsushima. Yeah, and already it's like, okay, we've seen enough of these games year after year. And Sony got some flack for doing that with like God of War and Spider Man and Horizon, where they just kept showing them. Um, so it makes sense for them to pull out. Um, I think the sense that I've gotten and what I've heard from people who are like mm. in the know or hearing that buzz is that Sony just like does not see E3 is like good for them and they don't want to be at mm. E3 for mm. a variety of reasons. Mm. It's not just that they don't have things to show. Um, and it's also a very, very strong sign that they're gearing up for a PS5 reveal event, yeah, which sure. um, I wouldn't be surprised to see something that's like an event in the fall where they reveal it and they say, hey, this is coming next year, 2020. Um, so I wouldn't be shocked to see something go on like that. And by yeah. the way... Uh, anyone who thinks that I'm a corporate shell, the the number of things that like the number of times that I've pissed off these publishers by talking about things like this <laughs> right. is just like like it's so funny to see that expressed when like I have a Rolodex full of PR people who I have pissed off for one reason or another because of all these things that we have been reporting. It's it's just hilarious. It's it's I found it very amusing and and hopefully these people educate themselves a little bit. Yeah, um, I mean, yeah, I've seen, uh, I've never really ever subscribed to that idea. Uh, I've, I, I appreciate it. Yeah, you've, uh, I mean, I, I followed you, I think the first time I, I took notice of your work was uh, when, when, I do actually want to ask this, when you leaked um, the Fallout 4 script, um, and there's some discussion surrounding what constitutes, like, a good leak, like, what what makes that because sometimes it might spoil something, but other times it might be informative. Like, I think uh, the Fallout 76 uh, leak where, where you talked a bit about that this is going to be an online survival RPG and I think you made a fair point where um, pre-orders went up but there was really barely any information about the game so I think it was important. Yeah and I'm a Bethesda corporate shell so I, I <laughs> right. clearly wanted didn't want people to know what the mm -hmm. game was. No, the, the Fallout 4 thing is interesting so I actually think that a lot of people are just super uh, misinformed because I actually saw I think it was on one of your videos mm -hmm. I saw a YouTube comment that was like Jason Trier leaked the entire script of Fallout 4 before it came out and spoiled the game and actually if you go back and you look at the article and it's still online mm -hmm. you yeah. can find it just search Kotaku Fallout 4 mm -hmm. leak script mm -hmm. um so first of all important distinction journalists don't leak we are le things people leak things to us yeah, we right. do not leak right mm -hmm. so i did not leak fallout 4 people leak uh, the fallout 4 script to me so what happened was someone sent me about 10 pages of the script on that script was and i'm going to spoil the intro of fallout 4 but on that script was actually um there were a few details a few random scenes and then there were details of uh how you get frozen and your wife or husband is killed and then your son is kidnapped right mm -hmm. and so what we actually chose to do was we chose to pr print a couple of the pages but not the ones that would spoil the story because mm -hmm. we didn't want to spoil the story sure. and if you go back and you look at that you can see that so important context here right mm -hmm. and I, I think a lot of people forget this or don't know about it so when this was happening what there was this website called the survivor 2299.com do you remember this yes it was basically <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah it was this big arg and it turned out to be a hoax right yep. and within that context we said hey we know that Fallout 4 is real. A lot of our readers right now are just like super depressed and questioning this and are like, oh my god, like this this all turned out to be a hoax. Is Fallout not happening? What should we do? Yada, yada, yada. So we decided, okay, we are going to post a couple pages from the script to prove that we know it's real. We are going to put it in this context of like, yes, this thing was a hoax, but Fallout 4 is real. It's happening. It's set in Boston. Mm -hmm. that we're not going to spoil the story or anything, but that's what we're going to tell you because this is very newsworthy right now. It's not just spoiling an announcement for the sake of spoiling an announcement. It's within this context, there mm -hmm. is news to it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what we did. And we posted a couple of script pages and we said, hey, here's what we know. This game is in, in, in development. It'll be out in a couple of years and that's mm -hmm. the end of it. Um, it's a very far cry from what people have said, yeah. which is that we spoiled the entire story of Fallout 4, which is nonsense. Right. Like we wouldn't 
do that, mm -hmm. um, or at least I wouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, just just clearing that up mm -hmm. for people. Um, but yeah, but that was our logic. And these days, uh, at least my personally, my perspective on leaks and when to talk about things have changed. Like for example, we knew, or I knew back in uh, a while back that mm -hmm. the next Assassin's Creed or that Odyssey was set in Greece. Yeah. Um, I actually know what the next Assassin's Creed already is, but, but we decided uh, not to like just spoil these things for the sake of spoiling them. And instead we, we decided we, we've had a lot of conversations about this and a lot of debates about this. And, and now our thought is like, if there is news value to this, if there is context mm -hmm. to this, that makes it an important thing to talk about. Um, Diablo four is an example of a game that I will be talking about soon mm -hmm. because there is important context around it right mm -hmm. now. Okay. Um, it, was that leak ultimately what, Got, got you banned from black it was one of the things it was actually in the context of a few other things there was also um we said that arcane was making prey right, uh, right. a new prey 2 it was called back then um and they were pissed off about that because we made it clear that they were misleading people misleading gamers when they said that they arcane wasn't doing uh, mm -hmm. a, a new uh, a new prey mm -hmm. and then that was one thing and then i also ran a story in april of 2013 about doom 4 um, being in development hell, and this was like mm -hmm. as they were just rebooting mm -hmm. and turning it into what would become Doom 2016. Mm -hmm. But back then, it was going through serious Same. development struggles. So it was a combination gotcha. of all the, those three stories that led to Bethesda just piecing out and blacklisting us. And okay. to this day, by the way, it's really amazing. But uh, uh, not a single game journalist or interviewer has asked Pete Hines, who's Bethesda's mm -hmm. marketing guy. Yeah. On the record, hey, what makes you think it's okay to blacklist a, an independent games outlet? So mm -hmm. that's very curious. Nobody, mm -hmm. Nobody's asked them that yet. Well, uh, maybe one day. Maybe, maybe, one day. maybe somebody watching this can put the question yeah. out there. Yeah, good luck. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, this one uh, I think is interesting. Jim J. Uh, 0.103 from YouTube. What steps should be taken to minimize the garbage that plagues our industry? Uh, Force Crunch released. Uh, I mean, we kind of talked about this, but... Uh, yeah, like minimize stuff like force crunch, release, release now, mm. then fix later type of mentality, non loot box practices that overall hurt the games uh, industry and the value in the community. Yeah, a few different things here. So force crunch, that has to come from game developers mm -hmm. and them just like like yeah. banding together. Unionizing in some way, I think, is, is the best solution there. Mm -hmm. um, I think... Uh, I mean, so buggy releases. I mean, that's a real problem. Just releasing mm -hmm. games that are games, that, games continuing to come out that are in bad shape. Um, I'm not sure what there is to do about that, other than like what we've seen traditionally is that um, what happens is that these uh, a game might sell well, like Assassin's Creed Unity, turn out to be super buggy, and then the next game will be punished for it. So mm -hmm. like Syndicate didn't sell well because mm -hmm. of that, um, and that almost feels like I don't know counterproductive, yeah. and it's almost too bad to see that. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't really have a, sure. a, a solution for that problem other than, like, I don't know, I mean, game publishers giving game developers the time they actually need. Right. Um, I do think that, like, one of the things that that we probably should have seen by now and maybe will see is uh, games going up in price. And I know $60 is already super expensive, mm -hmm. but but I think that publishers are it's it, it feels like it's hit this false stopping point that that has not kept up with inflation mm -hmm. and it just feels like games are getting bigger and bigger and you're still getting i mean it's ridiculous that like you get this you spend the same amount uh, same amount on red dead redemption 2 as you did on like i don't know two worlds back right. in the day that terrible euro <laughs> rpg right. that was like garbage um and yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I've been yeah. thinking about this a lot because while inflation has been going uh, and and the value of the dollar has been going down, wages have been stagnating. So yeah. it's not like people out there can suddenly afford to pay a bunch more money for the yeah. game. So it is a real problem. And I wonder, I do wonder what will happen if they, like a mm -hmm. publisher says, hey, we're going to make our all our games $70 or $80 or right. whatever. I, I, I do worry about yeah. like what the... I mean, there's some argument that because of all the different editions that they put out there for the games, the deluxe editions that come with uh, the exclusive mission, the exclusive right. content, that on, in some respects they've already kind of jacked up prices just a little That's more true. underhandedly. And the new trick, the trick that we're going to start seeing even more now is pay more to play the game early. Early. That's one of the questions, actually. Uh, any thoughts on that? Any inside perspectives? 
Yeah, I think it's conniving and kind of brilliant of these publishers because it's like they they know that like everyone wants to be the first person talking about something Mm -hmm. and hey, give us an extra twenty bucks and you could be the first wave talking about this game. And man, it's that 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 is certainly shady. Um because if a game is ready and can be played by people like just fucking release it. Yeah, who pre ordered, who already bought it, who've already kind of committed to, hey, I'm gonna buy this product. They get they get it late because they didn't subscribe or whatever. Yeah, it's weird. I mean, that, I mean, yeah, I certainly think that mm-hmm. is shadier than some of the other things mm-hmm. we've talked about. So uh, I think uh, we're at a good place. Uh, I guess I'll just ask one more question to leave this yeah? things off on a more positive note. Uh, which game do you think will win uh, Game of the Year, and what's your personal Game of the Year? Oh, man. So uh, I don't really, I mean, my game, of the, my personal Game of the Year just kind of oscillates. Like, mm-hmm. I mentioned some of my favorites. Yeah. Into the Breach is one of my favorites. Um, God of War, Spider-Man, mm-hmm. Red Dead 2, mm-hmm. Assassin's Creed Odyssey, um, some others that I am not even thinking of right now. But I haven't had a chance to play everything that I want to play just yet. Mm-hmm. Um, so I have a long, long list of games that I, I am considering. This game called Return of the Ober Din, everybody's mm-hmm. been raving about it. And I'm super excited to play that. So it's hard for me to answer that last question. Sure. Um, I think that... Uh, just like at the Game Awards in a couple of weeks, um, I think it'll pretty easily be Red Dead 2. Oh, yeah. Um, although it is the first year in a while that we've had real competition because mm. it's either going to be that or God of War. Uh, I think Red Dead 2 has impressed enough people and just mm-hmm. does so many innovative things uh-huh. as opposed to God of War, which is kind of just like... God of War is a very video game video game. Yeah. It's very much like like the the distillation of everything that makes for a good action uh, action mm-hmm, game. Mm-hmm. And just does everything really well. Red Dead Two is this weird, wonderful, yeah. just crazy. Like it's a it's an absurd video. Yeah, there's it's nothing just, like that out there right now. Yes, um, it is just very unusual, and I think that'll be rewarded. And I also think that uh, for in awards, awards in general, story is generally rewarded. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I think Red Dead Two storytelling is just gonna put it over the edge. Yeah. Uh, is is correct me if I'm wrong, but is Fortnite up there as one of the nominees? It's one of the ongoing games. Oh, okay. But not, okay. Uh, but not, and also, I think it came out last year, if okay. I remember correctly. Okay. Because um, I know yeah, a, couple, a, a couple outlets already, like, they're saying Fortnite Game of the Year 2018, I think. I, I might have seen that. but It's interesting. Yeah. I mean, in, in today's world, the concept of Game of the Year is kind of strange and yeah. obsolete to begin with because so many of these games are just changing constantly. For sure. And, like... I don't know. It's it's games today. Games that came out this year are competing with well, like even games that came out last year are very different this year mm-hmm. than they were last year. So it's it's very bizarre, mm-hmm. very bizarre world that I think we're all just kind of still trying to figure out the right words to mm-hmm. and the right like systems to deal with. I mean, game reviewers, for example, it's difficult to review games because a game that you review in September might be totally different in October, right? right. Like you look yeah. at Destiny Two, and that game is just changing so much or, constantly. Or Warframe. A review, yeah. just yeah, or Warframe or Fortnite. Yeah. Like you look back at reviews of Fortnite from last year, and it's like, what? <laughs> yeah, um, right. yeah it, it's it's a brave new world, mm-hmm. and I think that people are just still trying to find ways to deal with it, and in, in all sorts of ways. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I'd say that's a pretty succinct response right there. And uh, cool. Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, I'm, I can't promise that everything I do moving forward will necessarily agree with you, but I, I do definitely uh, want to keep what uh, things that were expressed here in mind moving forward. Um, and so I that's think that's good to hear. And yeah, I don't expect us to agree on absolutely on a, yeah. everything. Um, although I think, yeah, I mean, I think we do agree on a lot of things. Mm-hmm. It's just that I see these a lot of these things as just like like annoyances or things that like might bother me a little mm-hmm. bit and I don't see them as like, oh my god, time to start a customer movement about the like right. I, I don't know. I, I it might just be because I'm getting old and just don't have the bandwidth to care as much or it might just be because I'm excited about so many mm-hmm. things in gaming that I just don't right. really like, care that much about the things that bother me. But right. I don't know. Like I, I could give a shit what EA is doing these days. Like I'm not expecting to enjoy yeah. anything EA puts out these days. Yeah. Um I'm looking forward to Anthem, but part of me feels like yeah, who knows what same. that is going to be like. And yeah, and that's, yeah, I mean, that's so, unfortunate. So for, 
Yeah, it is unfortunate, but it's also for me. It's like instead of if if Anthem ships and it has some bugs, or it's like a, a seventy five quality game or something like that, or it crashes on launch or whatever it is, I, instead of like getting really angry about that, I don't know. I mean, maybe I just like. I mean, we'll certainly cover it and report on it and try to mm-hmm. figure out why it's happening. But just to to rail on it, just I don't know, it doesn't I, I, seem I, that productive. For I me. think but that's yeah. Me. I think for, for me, uh, people are just so attached to certain studios they grew up with. So Anthem is Bioware, which is why I hope it's uh, just you know it meets expectations. But I also feel like it won't, um, and especially with the backpedaling on the storytelling elements. Which, you know, we'll see how that works out. I can't say for sure that that'll be bad or anything, but, mm-hmm. but you know, we're attached to Bioware, we're attached to Bethesda, so even if we have CD Projekt Red doing great things, we still want to see Bethesda pull through and mm-hmm. not, uh, or EA's Star Wars stuff. We want to see Star Wars be made in a way that's just fantastic and everyone can love. And when that doesn't happen because, you know, the, the higher-ups uh, interfere with that somehow. Uh, yeah, it for me, it is, it is something that I feel passionately pissed about sometimes and uh, mm-hmm. th- that may be that may be the, di- the dichotomy there that we may not always agree on but also i do understand that yeah uh i mean something else to consider um that is that might seem obvious but is not something we mm-hmm. think about a lot is that nobody wants to make a bad game even sure. andrew wilson is not like i want to ship a bad game like he every single person involved at ea wants to make the highest possible metacritic games they want to make the best possible things that they can make but they'll cut corners um, won't they Right. Well, but so video games are very hard to make. And yeah. even if you give a team of people, a team of super talented people, like infinite budgets and unlimited time. Mm-hmm. And I mean, basically what Blizzard does, even if even if you do that, that's still not a guarantee of mm-hmm. success. Um, look at Blizzard, look at Titan, look at StarCraft Ghost. Like they mm-hmm. have so many failures, even yeah. though they have more resources than most companies. Mm-hmm. And I think that's something that that doesn't excuse products that ship in buggy ways mm-hmm. that doesn't excuse bugs that doesn't make it so that doesn't that that isn't an excuse that isn't to that isn't going to nullify criticism it's not it shouldn't prevent criticism but it's something that i think uh we should all be thinking about yeah. when we try to have empathy for some of the people who are putting their all into this mm-hmm. and even fallout 76 i mean a lot of people work very hard on that game yeah, yeah. a lot of people love that game and we're hoping to make mm-hmm. it as great as possible and even if it isn't it's still worth thinking about that like as we are talking about these things and just just sparing yeah. some thought for, for sure. uh for for those people and for the people who who made these things yeah for sure having more empathy in general i yeah, think is that's something fair. that we could all do yeah myself no, included. I, I couldn't disagree or yeah i couldn't agree with you more uh yeah. is what i'm trying to say um well, but yeah it, it's unfortunate i think the the developer side of things is is to me what what's more most like heartbreaking because it like I, I don't put out these videos and go ha yeah like part of me like there's a part of me that goes the, the devs put a lot of work into this and it sucks, but I, at the same time, you know, I, I have feelings about these things and sometimes I... Yeah, I, I don't think you should be dishonest mm-hmm. or just, uh, you should not hold back mm-hmm. your feelings, but yeah. yeah like I said, I mean, yeah, the thought process that I, I try to use and mm-hmm. fail to use, but just thinking like, imagining that I'm in a room with, with this person that I'm talking about and, and just imagining would i say this to this uh-huh. person's face uh-huh. if i wouldn't say this to this person's face am i being uh-huh. fair and that's that's always the big question okay. that i want to ask is like am i fair being enough. fair about this sure that's and fair that doesn't mean be dishonest it doesn't mean hold back your criticisms uh-huh. it just means try to be fair about them and that's yeah. that's my perspective on and what i hope to see yeah. like the level of discourse raised to that level right yeah no it's a good perspective to have and at, at the very end of the day at least i can definitely say you know Fuck the people at the top of the pyramid who <laughs> enable this shit. So, you know, I think this is a good, good stopping here, point. Here. Yeah. Cool. Um, thank, well, you thank you so you much. Again. Yeah. Thank you so, well, thank you, Young. I really appreciate you having on, me on here um, and letting me have a chance to, mm-hmm. to talk with you a little bit and address your audience a little yeah, bit about these sure. issues and get my perspective out here. Yeah, I mean, uh, despite, even if we don't see eye to eye on everything, I... I always respected your work i've always respected your uh, work ethic and so um i appreciate that yeah i hope uh i don't know we can stay in touch and and you know i'd rather there be communication even with disagreements instead of you know 
keep the back and forth. Uh, and, you know, uh, I'll, I'll take you up on seeing if you can hook me up with a few devs that I can honestly have a chat with and see what their perspective sure. is. I don't know if sure. they'll be able to tell me everything because, like you said, there's certain stipulations there. But, you know, maybe I can get something out of that. Um, Fantastic. So, yeah, but yeah, l- yeah, look forward to, to more of your work. And uh, I, I'm hoping for the best for the gaming industry as a whole and looking forward to all the amazing games that are, that are in development. Yeah. Sounds good. Thank you, Yang. Yeah, all right. Um, so uh, with that, everyone, thank you for tuning in. Um, I'll see you next time. Yong out. <laughs>